You said to me when we went out for dinner a couple of months ago, I asked you what I should be doing with my life. And you said what you're doing right now, I think, is pretty good. And then you said truth in the service of love. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? You just brought it up again. Well, it's a hierarchy of virtue, I would say. You know, there's an old idea that God is the sum of all that's good. I don't think sum is exactly the right metaphor. It's more like, imagine there are eternal verities, truth, beauty, justice, love, courage, fortitude, compassion. Think of all those things as virtues. So virtue is what all virtues have in common. Virtue is what all virtues have in common. That's the relationship of God to the good. God is the essence of the good. So well, we put that aside for a moment. Or you may think, how would that manifest itself in your life? Well, that might be pursuit of the good. And that's the pursuit of the good that unites all proximal goods. And Well, what is that exactly? Well, it's something like the belief that it would be for the best that all things flourish to the degree that that's possible. When, it, when I was a clinician, I thought of that as the good in me serving the best in my clients. And I think the desire for that to happen, that's love. So that's the desire for, you say, well, you take a human, bent, broken, miserable, malevolent, hurt, corrupt, weak, pathetic, contemptible, frustrating, disappointing, all of those things that we can lay on ourselves because of our inadequacies. It's like, it's easy to dismiss that, and part of that dismissal is what drives the notion that the planet has too many people on it and that we're a cancer on the face of the earth. It's like, it's not easy to love that. But what do you want? You want the broken people to rise up right, out of their brokenness rather than despise them for it. And then you orient yourself towards that and try to pull that out of people and yourself. And, and th you have to have that frame first. That's what you're aiming for. And maybe that would be the opposite of hell. This is one thing I would say that unites Sam Harris and I, despite our differences in, in belief in some sense at the level of detail. Sam is very acutely aware of the reality of malevolence and hell. Now, he wouldn't frame that metaphysically or religiously, but it doesn't really matter. He is doing his best to aim away from that as hard as he possibly can. See, I didn't realize till the last time I talked to him that Sam identified the religious tradition, the dogmatic religious tradition, with the totalitarianism that produces atrocity. Now, I think that's a misidentification, the same way the Marxists blame inequality on capitalism. Inequality is really a problem. But it's not the fault of capitalism. And totalitarian atrocity is really a problem. But to identify that reflexively with religion, or even with religious dogma, that's a mistake. Dogma, maybe. But even that's tricky, because what's the difference between dogma and knowledge? You know, today's knowledge is tomorrow's dogma. And d drawing the line between those two is extremely difficult. You can't just abandon everything you think, even though it's arbitrary. You <laughs> You need it to guide you. And it can transform into totalitarian dogma and promote atrocity in the, servants of, in the service of its no longer valid maintenance. But that's a very complicated problem. So if that's love. Love, yeah. Truth. Truth in the service of love. Mm -hmm. Well, truth to begin with is, well, okay, we could take that apart a bit. What you talked about letting the tiller of the boat go. Well, imagine that you treat. So we're having this conversation. And let's say I want this conversation to go the best way it can possibly go. Okay, well, I don't know what that way is, but I have to want that to begin with. So I come to the conversation. I think I'm going to try to have the most engaging conversation that I can have. I'm going to say what I believe to be the case during the conversation. I, there isn't something I want from you, except that hopefully we can meet in that endeavor. I'm not trying to craft the outcome. 
I don't know what we're going to talk about. You know, we talked a little bit about possible broad themes, although I don't think we touched on any of the things we actually discussed. <laughs> that doesn't mean we didn't need to do the preparation. You know? And then you think, well, whatever we accomplish in the course of a genuine dialogue is for the best. And that's to let go of the, of the tiller. And truth does that. It's like because you can't craft the outcome. And so what you're doing by engaging in truthful dialogue is letting the wind blow where it's going to blow. And you do that if you've decided at some fundamental level, even if you don't know you've decided that, that the truth will set you free and the truth is what is, in the final analysis, redemptive. And we tend to think of truth, we tend to think that truth resides in a set of accurate facts. That's actually the weakness, I would say, of the materialistic atheist position, that axiomatic presumption about the nature of the truth. But the truth is a process, it's, 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 and it's often a dialogical process. So the truth is the thing that emerges in the course of the search for the truth. It's something like that. And true truth is to be found in the search for the truth. That's the process that continually revitalizes things. And so, and then if your orientation is towards the good, to the degree that your orientation is towards the good and your belief that the good can prevail, which is, a, which is a, an article of faith, right? The good can prevail. It's like, what's your evidence for that? There's evidence for whatever position you want to hold on that. So it's a decision. And you let go and the truth takes you away. And you think that it's going to go where it should go. And you, put, you commit yourself to that idea. And then that's your adventure. That's the thing that's one of the things that's so cool about that. It's like, you need this adventure to buttress you against tragedy. There's nothing more adventurous than the truth. And in fact, it's the only true adventure, obviously. You just have to think that through for 20 minutes. How could it be a true adventure if it wasn't true? And then why is an adventure if it's true? Because you're not crafting the outcome. And so what does that mean? It means you've decided that the truth is what will set you free. And, and that's independent in some sense of the evidence. One of the things my family has learned, and this has taken a lot of learning, is that there's been at least, I would say, 50 times in the last five years where we thought we'd be taken out by what was happening around us. Sometimes those were big things. There was probably 10 of them, like they were public and, and famous. And then there was like 40 things that weren't so big, but were still plenty big. And it was always the same thing. It was hot as hell for weeks, but flipped. Always, always. But that doesn't mean it was pleasant to live through the part when it wasn't flipping. It was horrible. But so far, so far, we've been able to let go of the tiller and let the waves take us where they'll take us and not flip the boat.